three, two, one. And shall we start? Uh, yes, we are back online. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Digital Future 2022 um, Young Scholar Symposium. So today is the last session for the innovative structure and the materials. So um, I'm the moderator, um, Nick Bao from RMIT University, um, School of Architecture and Urban Design. So today the, <clears throat> the speaker will be um, uh, Dr. Ting Chao. Um, she's an assistant professor from Harbin Institute of Technology, Shenzhen. So before joining HIT Shenzhen, uh, she worked as postdoctorate researcher at ETH and hold a um, doctor degree from ETH and a master degree, bachelor degree from Southeast University. The second speaker will be um, Dr. Xin Yan. Dr. Xin Yan is a postdoctor researcher at Future Lab, uh, Xing, Tsinghua University. And also um, he is a joint studio leader at MIT Architecture, working with me on a MIT Bachelor of Architecture Beijing traveling studio. So before joining Tsinghua University, he worked as a PhD visiting scholar at Central for Innovative Structure and Material at MIT, leader by Professor Max Shear, and he received a Bachelor of Mechanics from University of Science and Technology of China, and a Master and, and a Doctor degree of Architecture and Engineering from University of Chinese Academy of Science. The, the third um, speaker will be um, Matthias um, Melhofer. Um, he is a researcher associate at the Institute for Computational Design and Construction, ICD, at University of Stuttgart. Before um, joining the ICD, Matthias worked as architect in Austria and the uh, Netherlands, and he holds the Bachelor of the Degree of Architecture from Vienna University of Technology, as well as a Master Degree from University of Stuttgart. So the last speaker will be Mohamed um, Fort um, Hanifa, he is a PhD researcher at the School of Architecture of the University of Minghong, EAUM, in, um, in Portugal. Um, he holds a Master in Advanced Architecture degree from UPC and um, AAC at Barcelona, Spain. And also I want to mention before the, um, the lecture, I want to mention the Architecture Intelligent um, Journal um, edited by Professor Philip Yuan. So this journal is focusing on the um, architecture design simulation, optimization, construction and operation and um, inhabitation. So this is a new um, journal, uh, which is um, published by the speakers. So welcome to, um, for everyone to, um, to contribute your paper and research. So, Let's welcome the, uh, the first speaker, um, Professor Ting Chao. Okay, uh, hi, Lee. Thanks for your introduction. Uh, I'm quite honored to be the first also, uh, speaker today. And also thanks for the invitation of Professor Felix Yuan. Um, now I can share my screen uh, presentation. Yes. Uh, um, as uh, Nick just introduced, I had my PhD at ETH Zurich. Uh, the presentation today will be the same, as, um, more, more or less the same topic as my dissertation, doctor dissertation at ETH Zurich. Uh, it introduced a new type of frame for surface structures. I called it smooth poly hyper uh, surface structures. Um, here we will we, here will be three parts. Sorry, we have 20 minutes for each presenter today, right? Just be sure. Yeah, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, um, I will introduce three parts today. The first part, uh, somehow it's, um, it explains my basic motivation to do this research. Uh, it's also a short review to introduce the uh, design and the fabrication method in frame for surface structures. The second part, I will explain the geometric definition and structure behavior of smooth poly hypersurface. Uh, because the smooth poly hypersurface is a smooth combination of hyperbolic paraboloids, so the introduction will include 
two levels. The first level is focused on the basic module, the hyperbolic paraboloid, and the other level will be the global for that would be a, a global frame for a surface. Uh, at the end, I will explain uh, uh, the application of this new type of uh, frame for surface structures with uh, three built examples. They were built with different material, but all in a, a very quick and easy uh, low tech way. Um, it doesn't lead to some complex fabrication methods. That's also the basic motivation I, why I developed it. Uh, this research. So I, I for, at first I talk about the free and for structures in architectural design. As we know, uh, free and for surfaces are quite popular in architectural design. It has been developed together with this theory of continuity in architectural design in 1990s uh, with the development of uh, digital tools in architectural um, um it somehow this continuity theory of continuity has two levels. The first level, at first it was somehow focused on the uh, continuity of the design process. At the, uh, gradually this continuity of design process turns into the fashion in continuous form. That's how the uh, frame for surface become more and more popular and become somehow considered as the new architectural forms in uh, new architectural forms in digital times. You could see in some very famous projects, uh, this special geometry are applied um, to, design, to, to shape the uh, building and also to shape the space. They are quite interesting to create the amazing space uh, there. But there also remains some problems. And generally the technical problems in uh, structural behavior and construct uh, in structural efficiency and uh, construction. In terms of construction, it normally leads a uh, uh, customized element. And this element are normally somehow uh, fabricated in a more or less uh, complicated way. And during the assembly process of these elements, it normally needs a lot of uh, scaffolding to support it. So it's quite time consuming and also alert uh, consuming. And on the other other hand, in terms of structure, most of the frame for surfaces, they have some problems in terms of structural behavior, such as this famous one, you could see this very elegant arch, this uh, curved surface, but somehow it's not able to avoid this, uh, this extra wall under this. This wall is part of the load bearing structure, but it's not integrated as the shape of the whole structure. That's also the remain problems should be somehow uh, um, studied more. So that's my basic motivation to uh, develop this research. Uh, so the focus is somehow try to integrate the fabrication process and the structure efficiency of the uh, frame for surface structures through the geometrical form. So the geometrical form is somehow a mediate between these two. Uh, if we looking back into the history, we already, we could have found uh, quite a lot of exploration in this, uh, in this area. And the most famous one would be the Felix form funding method. Uh, it was somehow used by many famous engineers like uh, Andoni Gauti, Hans Isler, uh, for autumn's magic, many engineer architects already somehow exploded. Uh, some, the advantage of this method is that it can easily integrate the structure behavior with the shape of the geometry together. So the efficiency of the structure is very high, such as this shell designed by Hans Isler, and he made with a handy model, the whole structures, the whole shell can be only a few centimeters. But the fabrication method, fabrication process is still complicated. At that time, Isler he developed, developed a machine to, to measure the shape of the shell, to measure the curve of the shell by, by sections. And then he constructed this wood formwork to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, cast the concrete for the, for the shell structures. Or like this one by Musmedi, he designed a bridge with a stretched membrane, and also the shape is very complicated. 
uh, complicated, so he didn't join the somehow involved in the fabrication at the end. The bridge was fabricated by a ship fabrication company at the end. So what is missing in this part is that the, the construction somehow is not involved. Uh, and comparing to the form funding method, there are also some other explorations in terms of surface structure. The most famous one is related to a special geometry um, called hyperbolic paraboloid. This one is a very special one because it's a ruled surface and also double curved surface. The double curved surface means it has a very good structural rigidity. Comparing with the flat one or the single curved surface, it's able to uh, take uh, undistributed nodes um, with only membrane force, with internal force only as membrane forces. So it's quite efficient. And in terms of construction, um, 50 years before or 15 to 16 years before, Candela already uh, constructed this shell, uh, this um, curved shell with straight uh, formwork because it's made with through surface. So it can be somehow fabricated in a cheap and easy way at that time. Uh, you could see that with Candela's work, they are also they can create it very elegant shape, and uh, uh, also this shape could define the uh, space under is quite nice. Um, so in in a work, if we check into the previous work uh, with hyperbolic paraboloid, we will find that hyper is a quite interesting geometry to integrate form fabrication and structure together. But there are still some problems remain unsolved uh, with hypergeometries or hypershells. Because as you already see in the previous examples, all these hypers, the adjacent hypers were joined together with curved edge. You will always find these curved curve lines between these two surfaces. They are not joined smoothly. That's a problem um, in terms of architectural, if you want to create smooth frame for a surface. On the other hand, it also resulted some problems in structure because all the internal force actually at the end will accumulate at the edges. Also at this uh, shared edge between two adjacent hyper. So it normally leads Stephen Bean at these parts. That's uh, where you could see the curved lines the upper part, you could also always find the Stephen Bean. So, uh, so that's a that's a two two weak point in terms of the previous examples uh, of hyper shells. Um, but uh, we can also find some inspiration from the work of artists. These are some sculptures designed by a very famous Swiss artist. He cooperated with Hans Isler design, uh, together to design these uh, sculptures. These sculptures are also made with hyperbolic paraboloid, but they are not joined with this curved edge, but they are joined smoothly with each other. So at the end, you could get this smooth surface from the beginning to the end. It's quite nice. Um, it's been a very good inspiration, but they just the, because the scale is very small, so they I just uh, started it with um, in terms of a uh, sculpture, but not as a structure. And geometrically, there are also some research about it. It is called a lead surface. And the research about a lead surface is only focused on the geometrical property of this surface. They use this surface to approximate frame for surface. So the frame for surface could be somehow fabricated in an easy bar. But there are no studies about the structural behavior of this surface. That's also where, uh, where my research uh, makes sense. Uh, so my research, I call it smooth poly hypersurfaces. They are smooth compilation of hyperbolic paraboloid. They are a special type of uh, a, uh, a led surface but somehow they have difference. The difference between the A-LED surface and the poly, smooth poly hypersurface 
actually is resulted from the structural requirement. Um, I will explain what's the difference between them. You could see uh, they share the same property. They are locally ruled because you could see clearly each module is a, uh, is a ruled surface, but globally they are free for because you could find this curve, uh, uh, smooth curves on the surface. Uh, in smooth polyhypersurface, there is one additional uh, geometrical constraint. constraint. Um, in a lat surface, the only constraint is that all the edges intersecting at one node should be coplanar. That means all these edges intersecting at one node should be coplanar. However, in smooth polyhypersurface, um, by following the coplanarity principle, all the straight lines intersecting at one node should be coplanar. That means that yeah, if we have two adjacent hyper here, hypers here, um, the two rulings and this, ed this edge, this shared edge, should always be coplanar. This ensures the structural efficiency of the smooth poly hyper surface. Uh, yeah, I mean this uh, this smoothly somehow this coplanarity principle also ensures the smooth, geometrical smoothness of the of this special type of surface. Generally, it can reach G one degree smoothness. In some special case, it can reach G two and G three and smoothness. Somehow, this is the geometrical or uh, geometrical properties. Um, we can come back to the uh, question that why is it in this additional constraint, which differentiates it from the ALAT works. This is because if we, I um, um, the I, I check, uh, we, we, we check the structural behavior or all the structure with graphic studies in our chair. Um, for this special type of surface structure, um, this um, parabol um, parabolic paraboloid, I also studied this uh, internal force and reactions with um, graphic statics. Uh, here I simplified them into a strata and time model. So you could see the, the uh, there are two groups of parabolas. The one in compression is the, are the blue ones and the tension are in red. So you could see two groups of um, parabolas in compression and tension. That's a I mean, very simple uh, conclusion we already get from the previous research. But the previous research only considered them these parabolas, they are par the rise of these parabolas uh, are parallel to the gravity. But in some case, if you rotate the hypers, um, the rise of the parabolas are not parallel to the uh, gravity. That would be something um, Candela and other research didn't uh, study before. And with my research, I found out besides the parabolas, the straight rulings also take the internal forces. So if you rotate hypers in space, besides the shell, it also part of the uh, surface also work as a wall. That means it's a combination between a shell and a wall. Uh, whatever at the end, all the reactions will always parallel to the, to the straight rulings of the surface. So that you see all the green arrows means the reactions. Uh, the necessary reactions to keep the internal force as membrane force. So all the reactions will be uh, uh, will always parallel to straight rulings. So if we join all these hypers together, if we want the internal forces can be transmitted from one hyper to the other hyper without causing bending moment, then we need to make sure all the forces can be transmitted in the plane without a uh, bending moment. That means all these straight lines intersecting at one node should always be coplanar. coplanar. That's why I get, that's why, where the coplanarity principle comes from. This is the first basic uh, principle of, of smooth body hypersurface. And the second one that Second one is the load path. If all the forces are transmitted, I mean, like the reaction forces are transmitted through the straight lines, then at the end, all these forces should be transmitted to the support or to the ground. 
In that case, it will form the load path uh, in the surface. You see that these are the uh, direction of the interactions. So uh, somehow they will transmit it along this load path to the uh, supports. Here you see one node path with only one support. So for this shape, you could support them with the straight wall and the, um, and the ground below, or you could, uh, could support them by uh, two wall besides and uh, one wall below. In these ways, they can all bring all the, they can bring all the load paths to the support. These are the two basic principles of uh, smooth poly hyper surface. Then, um, yeah, I mean, um, for the calculation, because we, we have the uh, way to calculate the inter internal force inside one hyper, um, when the hypers combine into smooth poly hyper surface, we also need to calculate the accumulation of the, of the internal forces along the load paths. So here we develop some uh, formulas. Mm, it's actually the vector calculation to uh, find out the forces accumulated along rulings and uh, the shared edges. At the end, we, we are able to calculate uh, the reactions and internal forces uh, of the smooth poly hyper surface. Uh, then I will explain, um, I hope I, oh, sorry, I don't have too, many, too much time left. Yeah, here I will explain three applications of the uh, uh, of this uh, smooth poly hypersurface with three case studies. They are built in different material. I can go a bit fast. The first is a, a pre-stressed grid shell made with um, aluminum rods. Uh, it was built in uh, the campus of Southeast University, and it was designed as a playground for children in this campus. Uh, basically, there are uh, two prototype, uh, prototypes uh, to design this, um, this uh, hyper pavilion, the hyperbolic void and the cantilever. Uh, they are all combined from uh, hyperbolic paraboloid smoothly. They are the single unit. And then with uh, three hyperbolic void and one cantilever, they were combined together to form the final shape. So you could see this is the final geometry. Uh, for the internal forces, it's different from the previous one I showed. In each hyper, it's not uh, like the previous one, the uh, half of the parabola in compression and half in tension. Here, because it, pre it is a pre-stressed shell, grid shell, so uh, all the cables are in, in tension. So it's a pre-stressed uh, grid shell. And we, uh, because these are all uh, made by students manually, and we designed uh, some um, standard collections uh, to construct this complex form. You could see uh, here, they made manually with this collection, uh, there are three hinges. So that's why the roller are able to rotate in any direction. With one, uh, one standard collection, we are able to solve uh, the rotation of the rulings in space in any direction. The still, uh, yeah, you could some, see some details here. They are collected with screws, and um, this is how we collect the cables. I mean, with the uh, with the rings tied by the plastic ties. In the fabrication process, students first fabricate each piece of uh, hypers, and then they put the hypers into the global form. At the end, they put the uh, cables to make the whole structure stiff. Yeah, these are the final results here. Then I go to the second case study. It's called Hyperwave, the uh, timber grid shell uh, made with uh, plywood. It, is, it was built uh, in a campus or uh, in, in an expo park at Shanghai. Yeah, it was designed from a very basic module of, hyper, of uh, smooth poly hypersurface made from six hypermodules. We check the load path from the support position and, uh, by, uh, and with the discretion of the six hypers, we, uh, we get somehow the final shape of the shell, make it uh, more, 
make it better for the site, the requirement of the size. At the end, it was made from uh, 64 pieces of high parts. Each of them were made with uh, plywood uh, with strips. And the, four, the three supports are made with uh, a triangle, the support made with steel plate. Uh, we fabricate the, the grid module first, assemble them together, and then cover them with uh, uh, wood strips. This is the fabrication process of each, uh, each uh, strut in a hyper module. We designed a jig to, um, to glue and twist each, uh, um, to twist each element in a hyper module. And then um, collect the four edges together and then put the rulings inside. Afterward, we put uh, each module together and put the strips above. This is a, yes, this is the final uh, pavilion. And the last one is what we is what we made last year is a concrete shell uh, covered uh, uh, solar house. It's called Solar Arc 3.0. Yeah, and it's a concrete shell supported uh, um, a truss with um, solar panels above. It was also designed with a uh, smooth poly hyper surface. Uh, what's different is that the basic unit is always the same. You could see inside of the square, this is a basic unit. So it's made from four basic units and the, uh, the others are half of this basic module. This is a model, uh, yeah, this is a small model for the workers to understand how the geometries are combined together. Yeah, in the factory, we made the straight, we made the module um, when we made the formwork for each module uh, with straight wood, then we cast the plastic, cast some plastic above it to make the final formwork for the concrete. Yeah, then we cast the concrete above. Here we left some holes. Um, yeah, because this is the prefabricated element, they will be transported to the uh, site, put together. Later, they will be uh, collected together with uh, high strong screws and they put the isolation and cast the concrete above. So this is somehow another layer of uh, formwork. You could see this is, yeah, it's me in the, uh, in the construction side. You could see these uh, modules already put together. Here they put the isolation insulation and later they will cast the concrete and put some uh, reinforcement parts above it. Then they will get the final result. This is the final uh, uh, final building at the end. This is the uh, interior view. It's a solar house. You could see this as a mm, it's very nice smooth um, surface uh, from interior. Okay, um, that's the end of my presentation. Sorry, it's a bit out of time. Hope it's not so much. Yeah, thank you, um, Professor um, Ting Chao. Uh, very, um, very um, wonderful presentation. Um, so any uh, questions from the audience? Um, yeah, <laughs> no questions. Um, Maybe we can lift all the question to um, to the end. But we can also have some discussion um, later. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the mm -hmm. presentation. So welcome to um, the next presenter, um, Dr. Xin Yan from Tsinghua University. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So let me show my screen. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I, I, I shared the wrong screen. It's right. You see the full screen. Yes. All good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's right, right. Yeah, all good. Okay. 
Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Nick Bao introduced me, and thanks for the Dr. Ting Tao the, the, the presentation. I was very impressed uh, from that. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be here to share my topic about the design or alternative topology optimization for architectural phone handling. And uh, I'm Xin Yan from Tsinghua University uh, uh, Future Lab, and I got my PhD and Master of Architecture and Urban Design degree in UCAS and a Bachelor of uh, Mechanics in USTC. So as you can see, I, I shared the, my, my research uh, background is combined with architectural design and mechanics. So today uh, I will talk a topic about the topology optimization application in architectural design. So recently in the two, uh, 20 years, uh, there are so many uh, very famous architectural design uh, designed with the topology optimization. As you can see, there are seven uh, projects uh, with many um, with different kinds of topology optimization method, and in uh, most, I think the one of the most famous one uh, famous project is finished by Sasaki and some uh, Japan architects. They developed a, a, a topology optimization method called Extend ESO method, which is developed based on the ESO method by Professor Max Xin. And you can see with this method, the, 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 the design can be reduced with, with many horses more and more, and, and then you will get a very beautiful and ele elegant design, uh, which is with very high perform structural performance. So, yeah, and, and there are also many uh, uh, future design in, in with the topology optimization. As you can see, the Zaha code designed the chair and the pavilion with the topology optimization. And, and my, uh, the, the intention of my research is uh, we, with my experience, uh, there is, I can see the conventional topology optimization method uh, have a lim limit application conditions in the early stage of architectural concept design. Uh, because in the early design, there are so many uh, un unclear uh, directions and many subjective modification intentions inside it. So when we use the conventional topology optimization, uh, we can, the designers can do nothing but make an initial rough model and you may image a, a, a very beautiful and a, a very beautiful structure form like this one, like this one. So then you start the optimization algorithms and wait, 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 and finish. So. When it's finished, you you will uh, you won't get a very beautiful structures, but the the result may be like this one. So, uh, th this one is the the, the result with the highest uh, structural performance, but is not what we want. So when when we you in that situation, you can only accept or reject the results. And you can't uh, do anything uh, except except for it. So, therefore, an uh, open framework based on structural topology optimization, which permits users to add their own design intentions uh, into the topology optimization process for pre-design or control the structural details, is very useful. And uh, in my research work, I designed an uh, open framework linked uh, Rhino, Grasshopper, Python, and Abacus. Abacus is a very famous FEM analysis software. So uh, 
uh, this is the difference. The, in, in the, the top picture is the conventional topology augmentation process. You design the basic model with script or Abacus or HyperMesh or any other engineering software. And you do the do all the cal calculation and optimization in the closed loop, closed the loop in inside the uh, Python code or, or any uh, software. But for designers, it's very hard for us to uh, take part in the process. So my uh, this framework breaks it into three pieces, and you can make a model in the Rhino and transfer the information into the data files like TSP file, and then transfer it into the Abacus to do the uh, FEM analysis and get the data. And then you, uh, you, you can use the data to do the uh, BISO uh, uh, topology optimization process, and then get a new model inside, uh, transfer it into the uh, Rhino development. So, with this framework, we can we can do many uh, freedom freedom surface design like this one. This one is the S phone one one, which is in Digital Futures to uh, twenty nineteen with Dr. Nick Bao and Professor Maxie. So we use this uh, framework to design a tree like tree like a uh, pavilion, and this is the uh, X phone. Two in IASS 2019 with Dr. Nick Ball and Professor Max Yu Chu. And uh, in, in this time, we modified the tree like pavilion form and uh, generate more smooth, more uh, curved surface. And also, the third project is uh, designed for the China uh, competition, uh, com com competition of a structure with Nick Bao and uh, Dr. Yulin Xiong. And, and uh, based on this framework, we can also add some artificial uh, control uh, data into the, uh, the topology optimization. So just like the yellow, uh, the orange one set shows, uh, you need, uh, basically, we can get a, we, we can make a model in the Rhino and re transfer the information model information into the uh, data files and then go to the abacus and uh, to the um, Python environment. But uh, at, at the same time, we can also use the grasshopper to generate some uh, other data uh, and and transfer them into the into the TST file and. Uh, also linked it into the modified the policy optimization, and then it will combine the, the structural analysis and the artificial intention uh, to, to generate a diverse uh, result. And these are some diverse uh, algorithms based on the, the based on this uh, research. And the first one is we uh, design uh, uh, use the geometric constraint to control the form. As you can see, when you design a high risk building facade, uh, you will get a, a asymmetric one because in the in the process, the number of the materials uh, reduced uh, may 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 not be uh, times of two. So. So it will at, at some at some step it will be asymmetric, and then it's asymmetric more and more. So in the final result, you can see that there are very there, there are some asymmetric uh, characters inside it. So if you if you has a geometric constraint and com coupling the two elements with the symmetric symmetric uh, positions. You will get a symmetric one result like this one. So, oh, it also will be used in the uh, per periodic structures. Uh, for the shell, 
a structure, if you use the conventional topology optimization, you will get this, this result. And if you take a close look, you, you will find that uh, there, there, are my, uh, there are some n uh, periodic parts inside it. And if you're just uh, coupling out the uh, elements in the uh, relevant positions, you will generate a more periodic structure like this one. So uh, I, uh, I think there, uh, there are th three more very important methods uh, modified based on the Bissell topology optimization. The first one is MR Bissell. Uh, this one is uh, in, in, in topology optimization, you will find the RMIN, which is uh, fitting radius, can, uh, can influence the size of structure members inside the final result. So if you can equip the uh, calculation with diverse RMIN values, you will control the, the member sizes in the final result. So just like this diagram, in the conventional BISO, Every, uh, each element will share the same RMIN values, and you will get a, a, a final structure with the uniform member sizes. But if you can give the, each element different RMIN values, it, you can influence the final result with diverse uh, structure members, just like this cantilever uh, example. Uh, the, uh, the, the right one is the uh, result with conventional BISO. So you can see there are only four structure members inside the center. But if you uh, generate different uh, radius values based on uh, just like this picture, uh, the, left, uh, the left elements are equipped with bigger uh, RMIN value and the right one with the smaller MI value, you will get this one. So you can see in the model, uh, in the middle part, the, the size of this, uh, of the, this part are thinner than, this, in the, than the member near the left one. So there is also example in the uh, high-rise building facade design. Uh, this is based on the basic uh, conventional BISO. And this one is, is with MRB, so which is uh, the, the bottom elements are equipped with the radius of uh, 15 meters and the top one with uh, only three meters. So you can see in the final result, the, the part near the bottom are very huge, uh, while the, 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 the top part is very thin. Also in the shell design, you will see if if I can, if if we can generate the different uh, radius values around the, the 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 shell, and you will generate very different uh, results like this one. So, so you can see the the the, the diagram A shows the conventional Bezo method with on all the elements with one hundred millimeters, and B is all the elements with 500 millimeters. And C is uh, from the boundary to the center. Uh, there are a gradient uh, values from 100 to 1500. And this one is 100 to 1500 and to 100 bike. And this one is 1500 to 100. So you can see with the smaller RMI value, you will pre-design the part, the structural part with very, uh, discrete and uh, structure members with very small sizes. And if you want to somewhere uh, generate the huge uh, structure, you can just uh, amplify the filter radius. And the second uh, method called MVB. So in this, in this uh, method, we can divide it, the initial model into several subdomains. And each subdomain can be encrypted a different uh, volume fraction. Volume fraction means that how many elements, how many materials will be reduced in the, in the topology optimization. 
So as you can see in the diagram, uh, in the conventional BSO, uh, maybe the, 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 the right part is, uh, we will have no materials in the final result. And more, re, more materials come, uh, come, come to the left uh, boundary. But if you just want to make the structure more uh, distributed, you will you you can just uh, divide it, the whole design domain into three, and 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 encrypt them with different uh, volume fraction, and then the the orange one will come to the only four, and the uh, green one come to the, the maybe there are ten elements maybe. So with this method, you can easily to control the the local materials property in the final result. So like this, the cantilever example, if you design the sub-design domains like this, there are six uh, different sub-design domain distributions. And with the different uh, local sub-design domain volume fraction, you will get, get uh, different um, results. And the NC value is the is uh, means the structural performance. So NC, if the NC value equals one, it means the uh, the structure share the same structural performance as the original BSO result. And if you bigger, if this NC value bigger than one, it will means that the the the, the structure has low lower uh, structural performance than the original BSO result. So with, with, with this method, with MVB, so we can easily control the, the, the facade because in, in origin, in, in, in a high rise building, if you use original BSO, you will get, generate this model. And uh, you can see for architectural design, the, the bottom low floor uh, has more solid walls in, in the results, but but uh, it may be not what architects want. So you can just uh, divide it into uh, several sub-design domains and just uh, reduce, the, reduce the local volume fraction of the bottom part and you will dig more hoses as the windows to, to the final result. Yeah. Uh, and you can also even generate this structure with the MVB. So just uh, with different uh, local uh, volume fractions. So there is one example with the MVB. So as you, uh, I think all of you know the, the, the Chinese 2008 Olympics National Stadium. And if, if we just uh, made a rough, rough uh, model like this, this one and add some loading case inside it. We will generate the different results with different MVB so uh, reference. This one, the the the, uh, the first one has the four sub design domains, and you can see the 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 final result uh, result is uh, there are so many solid uh, continuous uh, surface in the in the corners. But if you just uh, amplify the number of sub-design domains, you will generate a more smooth, the more distributed, and more thin, uh, uh, the, the more thinner uh, structural members. So the final one is called MVB. So in MVB, so we can generate, uh, we can just uh, uh, in introduce a picture inside the the, the topology of JSON. Uh, just uh, like this diagram. For the original BSO, maybe the final result will be like this one. But if a uh, designer introduced uh, just uh, a drawing, like the green part, so uh, you, you may want the, the algorithm care more about the uh, your design. So uh, the, the MVB so will care more about, uh, about your, your, your op op options. So it will generate um, a, a structure based on your uh, graphic design. So with this method, we can just uh, do some examples. Uh, with these four different graphic patterns, 
you will generate a different, uh, a very relevant uh, cantilever calculation with different uh, uh, parameter setting. So you can see the 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 the, the, the straight uh, black one, black line is the what we want to generate a structure, and and in the final result we will get a. Stru uh, structure member like this one. And with more different graphic pattern, you will generate a uh, different result uh, in the in the MW whistle. Also, you can just uh, change the weights of different loading cases. This one is the whistle results with only with the twisting loading in the center. And this one is the original diesel results with the gravity, only with the gravity. So if you change the uh, weights between them, you will generate a, a diverse structure design. And you can control the which one is more like the curved one and which one is more like the, uh, the, the one with uh, only with the gradient, a uh, gradient. So finally, uh, there is a real project with the uh, we designed with MWB. So this is a, a wall, and and if we just uh, add the two loading cases, shear force and wind force inside it, we will generate uh, th this result with the original vessel. So you can see because of the asymmetric geometry. And there will be a lot of materials remained in the in the in the corner, and this is what we don't want to want. And then we just uh, do a two D optimization and get this pattern. And then we just uh, use Grasshopper to uh, introduce this pattern into the three uh, D model, and then. We just uh, add the three uh, loading cases. The first one is cell force and wind force. And then we add a more artificial intervention pattern into the MWB. So, and we also want to keep the structural performance. So we amplify, we control the weight of the uh, loading cases uh, as the 0 .0, uh, 0 0.99. And only one percentage of uh, the artificial intervention patterns weight. So we will generate a final result like this one. Uh, if you, th th this is the artificial pattern being in introduced in, into the MW BSO, and this is the final BSO. So you will find that the M MW BSO will generate more structures to support the. The, the 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 structure and make the uh, uh, it's, it's like the, uh, the the algorithm modified the in, initial pattern with some necessary structure members so in the two, uh, in last year we built this uh, very elegant design in the Tongji University just a uh, as the uh, named the intelligence form with uh, the, this is finished with uh, Dr. Nick Bao and uh, the, uh, Professor Max Xie and other uh, members like uh, Dr. Uh, Jia Nanpeng. Yeah, so that's all. And, and if you have any questions, please contact me with the emails. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Xinyan, for the um, very excellent presentation. And I am quite familiar with um, many projects. And also thanks for the collaboration in the past years. So the next uh, presenter is uh, Matthias from ICD. Let me just quickly share the. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can see our mm -hmm. screen. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yes, so you can also hear me well? Yes, all good. Okay, perfect. Well then, hello everyone and also welcome to this lecture about lightweight and ultra lightweight structures and how they relate to behavior-based design, construction, and also adaptation processes. Um, also, thanks for the introduction in the beginning and for having me. Unfortunately, I prepared, prepared also another introduction. So we'll just quickly go over this. My name is Matthias Meyerhofer. I'm a researcher at the Institute for Computational Design and Construction, short ICD, at the University of Stuttgart, where I am affiliated with the Collaborative Research Center 1244, dedicated to adaptive structures and envelopes, and where I also take part in teaching students of the iTech Master Program, from which I graduated myself a couple of years ago. As probably for many of us, an important reference for my research is the pioneering work on lightweight structures by Frei Otto, and especially the Mannheim Multihalle from 1975. And what's particularly interesting about this free-form timber grid shell, which still to date is the largest of its kind actually, is the way in which it utilizes material behavior both structurally and architecturally, but also how it was utilized as a means to erect the structure in the first place. While the freeform geometry of this compression only grid shell results from a purely physical form finding process using tension only cable nets, its full scale materialization leverages the elastic properties of thin wooden lamellas to realize double curvature and ultimately a lightweight yet highly performative structural system. The material behavior, meaning the elasticity of these lamellas, also played an important role during the construction process that contrary to other shell structures, required barely any formwork. Here, the grid was first deployed on, the, on site as a flat sheet, which was then pushed inwards from the boundary and upwards from inside, causing the lamellas to bend into the designated shape. This construction process can almost be seen as a situated form finding process, given that the hinges of the grid were able to freely rotate as much as necessary to accommodate this transition from flat to doubly curved, and were only locked once the structure, quote unquote, form found its final shape. This way of conceiving, designing, and erecting structures, however, is by no means novel and can be traced back even to vernacular construction methods, in which structures were the result of in situ form finding um, based on the direct interaction between human designers and material behaviors. Nowadays, we refer to structures that utilize active bending of elastic materials as a self-forming and stabilizing strategy as bending active structures. A more recent example of a bending active structure is the 2010 ICD ITKE Research Pavilion, made from 80 unique, extremely thin, initially flat, and then elastically bent plywood strips. This level of complexity and differentiation was made possible by computational design processes, through which we at this point can only digitally approximate material behavior and structural performance, but also use material behavior as a driver for exploring the design space of such structures way more extensively than Fayotto ever could. The advancements in the digital domain, however, were and are still not really reflected in the physical domain where the intricate actions of maneuvering, positioning, and bending these wobbly strips is still dependent on human workers and limited to their intuition for such materials. Former students of mine therefore asked themselves how they could provide robotic assemblers with this intuition, meaning how to teach them to behave relative to the way elastic materials behave, just like the way we would do it without even really thinking about it. Using this intuition of material behavior, the robotic system was specifically developed to deal with the unpredictability of natural materials in construction, and thus to unlock robotic building with rapid renewable materials such as bamboo, for instance. 
The research was conducted through a case study in which a mobile robot was first trained in a virtual environment using deep reinforcement learning algorithms. And then this intuition or the neural network policy was utilized in both the process of designing the structure, but also in their in-situ in -situ robotic assembly. And what I think is very interesting about this project is that it not only teaches robots how to work with elastic materials, but even how to leverage their kinetic behavior to their advantage in this assembly process, meaning the momentum gained from swinging on the rod. My colleague and friend Valentina Soana and I had a fairly similar interest when developing this project called Self-Choreographing Network. Although we were not looking into assembling one final structure, but into ways to continuously morph between many elastic equilibria. So here we are now transitioning from designing and constructing to adapting lightweight structures. In a nutshell, self choreographing network presents a self-aware architectural robot conceived as a material machine system that exists and performs at the intersection of the digital and the physical space. It is made from bending active glass fiber rods networked through robotic joints. And the strategic integration of these two complementary systems allows for a significant, significant kinematic freedom with minimum amount of actuation. The goal of this project was to provide a framework for the exploration and full utilization of the kinetic design space inherent to elastic materials to also unlock their potentials for structural and architectural adaptation. In the context of this project, a change of state is achieved through the negotiation between the physical and the digital instance of the structure, resulting in a continuous change of network topology. The change of topology is physically executed by robotic joint agents capable of one axis actuation. One agent connects two elastic rods, one being fixed and the other one being actuated. Due to the utilization of torque sensitive servo motors, robotic joints are not only designed to actuate the system, but also to collect important feedback such as position and torque, while especially the latter provides insights into the behavioral response of the material to robotic joint behaviors. We initially started with a grid like network topology consisting of six rods and nine robotic joints. And while a similar setup worked really well for the erection of the Mannheim Multihalle, from a kinetic point of view, it was quite underwhelming. But by transitioning to a loop-based network with only two robotic sliding joints, we were able to significantly increase the dynamic design space while reducing the amount of both material and robotic parts. We also started trying to really understand the relationship between material behaviors and robotic behaviors, because already very early experiments have shown the impact of differently choreographed robot behaviors, both with regard to the forces acting upon the robots and the geometric outcome. In this video, for example, both agents perform the same action simultaneously. while in this video, the robots act sequentially, resulting in an inarguably different network behavior. So it turned out that this fourth dimension of time provides us with behaviors that are way more complex than we had actually expected in the first place, which then in turn confronted us with the challenge of developing a design environment that contrary to existing ones is capable of incorporating this dimension in order for us to really engage with it. Parallel to experience with the physical instance of our structure, we therefore also developed a digital instance based on a dynamic and interactive simulation environment capable of exploring, representing, and evaluating active changes of topology. Whereas the combination of both domains provided us with a cyber-physical real-time decision-making environment in which both sensor information and simulation feedback are negotiated to inform subsequent actions. But more importantly, linking the body and the brain provided the structure with an awareness of its own state, needs, 
and potential capabilities. This way, spatial choreographies could emerge from the interaction between two cognitive entities, the occupant or designer on the one hand and the robotic system on the other. At times, the kinetic capabilities of the structure may accommodate for specific design intentions, while at others, the structure might take the lead and propose alternative spatial conditions that not only satisfy its personal requirements, but may as well uncover architectural opportunities that otherwise would have remained unexplored. The exploration of emergent system behaviors may also take place more radically, for example, through an explicit manipulation of the system topology. By connecting both agents to the same rod, for instance, performances of a significantly different kind were achieved. In this very case, the structure has been allowed to achieve not only a change in shape, but also a change in position. Or in other words, it started to crawl. The last project I will show now is part of my ongoing research within the Collaborative Research Center 1244, entitled Adaptive Structures and Envelopes for the Built Environment of Tomorrow. It brings together 13 institutes from the University of Stuttgart, as well as three external institutions, involving a variety of disciplines, really ranging from aerospace engineering to architecture theory. One of the goals here is to realize the potentials of lightweight construction through structural adaptation on an architectural scale. In this context, um, structural adaptation refers to the concept of ultra lightweight construction, a term coined by Professor Sobeck, who describes ultra lightweight construction as an alternative approach to the established concept of lightweight construction. So instead of form finding optimal geometries based on determined form defining load cases, he argues, structures should be designed and enabled to adapt autonomously to changing or unexpected loads. And this can be achieved by rethinking the way in which we design for stiffness and strength, the two fundamental parameters for dimensioning a load bearing structure. Strength being a structure's ability to withstand an applied load without collapsing or plastically deforming, where stiffness refers to the degree to which an object resists its deformation due to a load case. In conventional construction, strength is achieved through a certain amount of material. The typical strategy to achieve a high degree of stiffness, meaning to reduce any kind of perceptible deformation, is to add more material and in fact a lot of material, given that a structure might also have to withstand extreme but extremely rare load cases during its lifespan. In ultra lightweight constructions, structures are only dimensioned in view of the bare minimum required to ensure overall strength and stiffness. The problem of extreme or unexpected loading scenarios, on the other hand, is addressed through sensor actuator mechanisms to actively manipulate forces and deformations. This allows for a reduction in required construction material by up to 70% compared to conventionally conceived and dimensioned structures. In this context, adaptivity can therefore be understood as a strategy to reduce the embodied energy of a building by compensating for the lack thereof through small amounts of operational energy. The so-called Stuttgart beam constitutes the first ever conceived ultra lightweight structure. It presents a bridge-like system with two support points, one of them being fixed, the other one being actuated, exhibiting two degrees of freedom. And in response to a point load, the support condition actively pivots and slides in order to distribute the system deformation. So as you can see here, the overall system deformation does not occur in one area, but is evenly distributed across the entire beam. While the deformation in the area of the load applied equals to almost zero. The Stuttgart Smart, Smart Shell constitutes the first ever realized ultra lightweight structure, spanning 10 meters with a thickness of four centimeters. This hydraulically anchored timber shell is capable of detecting deformations resulting from external influences, 
which are autonomously compensated through a distinct change of its adaptive boundary condition. So rather than enhancing movement and deformations as shown in the previous project, here the focus is really to provide a structural system with an awareness of its internal state in order for it to reduce undesired movements and deformations. Within the Collaborative Research Center, the goal is to transfer this principle to large scale and multi-story building systems. This is currently prototypically investigated through the development of an experimental high-rise building. The tower is conceived as a spatial truss system and machinic parts can therefore be embedded into the structural elements themselves and distributed across the structure, allowing for both local and global adaptation scenarios. The structure was erected at the university campus in Stuttgart about a year ago, right next to the Stuttgart Smart Shell and a former Fry Otto prototype, which houses the ELEC Institute. But we are not building a tower for the sake of it, but because the concept um, of ultra lightweight construction is particularly relevant for highly stiffness covered system, such as high rise or long span structures, which means there we can achieve the highest resource savings through smaller cross sections. For the sake of feasibility, obviously not each and every element can or even has to be actuated in such a system. Actuator placement algorithms therefore support the identification of strategic amounts of actuators, as well as their position in the structural system. Two kinds of actuation strategies are employed here, both of which attempt to minimally change the length of a structural element by means of hydraulic cylinders in order to induce artificial tension or compression to compensate for those um, resulting from external influences. Parallel actuation means to integrate the actuator into the respective truss elements. Given that this only allows for a ch change of length uh, within millimeters, it's almost impossible to see, but in the video on the right, you should be able to see like tiny little white dots popping in these four holes. Um, which indicates the actuator movements. Serial actuation, on the other hand, means to interrupt a structural element through an actuator, which, especially in the case of bracing elements, results in a somewhat perceptible deformation. This is a short video documenting the manufacturing of these structural elements and actuators. This is uh, a parallel actuator being installed into the steel profile. Here we see a serial actuator, the one from the bracings being prepared off-site for um, on-site assembly. And by the time this video was made, this was still a render um, of the finished structure. So I also oops, brought a picture of me from the current state. So on the left, we see the full structure. On the left is the adaptive high-rise building. The right is just an external staircase. And then we also see an interior view with serial actuators being installed into the bracing elements, whereas we can't really see the parallel actuators as they are hidden by the like hidden within the vertical elements. So, but the lack of specific tools for designing adaptive structures is currently still reflected in the way um, such structures have been conceived so far. As conventional structural typologies made adaptive through actuators and sensors. And this also applies to our high-rise building. And while this might be a valid strategy for benchmarking adaptive against conventional structures, research within the Collaborative Research Center has also shown that existing structural topologies cannot exhaust the true ultra lightweight potential. Designing for structural adaptation 
is therefore not only relevant in terms of resource savings, but might also unlock architectural opportunities that are yet to be explored. Here, designing a genuinely adaptive structure means to achieve a high degree of adaptability, or in other words, to maximize the degree to which the structure can successfully manipulate forces and deformations through actuation. And while we have centuries of experience and intuition for designing stability, we have no experience or intuition whatsoever for exploring adaptability. Making ultra lightweight construction beyond established structural typologies accessible for architectural practice therefore requires the development of methods, tools, and processes for incorporating adaptability as a design objective into architectural design processes, or more specifically, into early design stages when design options are explored and substantial decisions are made. And that particular challenge is what I'm currently investigating through my research, which is still very much work in progress, so I cannot yet show so much, but I would like to give you a brief overview. Okay. Sorry. Um, these were some old slides, so I would start with the concept of adaptability. And in a nutshell, and in the case of adaptive trust structures, adaptability is primarily a function of trust topology and the distribution of statical indeterminacy therein. We can measure the adaptability of a given structural layout using an analysis method based on redundancy matrices developed by my colleagues from structural mechanics. And these matrices provide us with highly local information on the extent to which actuation of certain structural members would affect the behavior of all other members in the system. What it does not explicitly indicate though is how or where we as designers would have to adjust the trust topology to maximize this effect. And moreover, such matrices have a dimension of number of elements by number of elements, leading to incredibly large amounts of information for structures of a significant scale. The challenge is therefore to develop a design method that is capable of leveraging this vast amount of information for the exploration of structural topologies. For addressing this challenge, we identified agent-based modeling, short ABM, as a particularly suitable method. ABM is a bottom-up modeling and simulation method used in many fields for gaining insights into the inner dynamics of complex systems. This in turn means exploring the relationship between system behaviors on the micro level and the respective emergent phenomenon on the macro level. In our case, we intend to gain insights into how local topological conditions affect the global adaptability of adaptive structures. In ABM, systems are modeled from the perspective of their constituent units. These units are conceived of, of as autonomous decision-making entities or agents that exhibit distinct behaviors or intentions informed by external stimuli that represents feedback. The agent's self-organization over time in turn is the result of their continuous interaction with each other and the environment in which they're situated. In our case, agents are defined as trust nodes, whereas an explicit relationship between two trust nodes defines a trust element. And at every iteration, the agent system evaluates the current trust topology using the redundancy matrix, which informs the agent behaviors involving adding, removing, or keeping trust elements until no more actions will improve local and thus global adaptability objectives. And with this, brief little outlook into future work. I'm already coming to the end of this presentation and I would actually like um, to, to um, round it off and close the circle back to this little diagram that I showed earlier. Um, just to highlight one point, which is that even though we can see that these are very different material systems and have very different behaviors themselves, um, What's becoming pretty obvious is that small and minimal changes of um, system topologies within these like network systems can really affect um, the adaptive behavior of such systems, um, really highlighting that the design of such structures um, should be um, supported by sufficient design tools so that we can actually explore 
these relationships between system topology, the resulting system and material behavior, and the adaptation responses we can gain from that. And that's what really um, summarizes my research. So I will leave it to here and finish my part. Yeah, thanks, Matthias, for a very interesting um, presentation. And, and we also, um, I also see some project before um, from ICD. It's very interesting now, can, can, can know more about the, the detailed information from your presentation. Thank you. So um, let's welcome the last presenter, um, Mohammed from um, EAUM. Um, hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me first? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Just I would like to thank you for this invitation, and um, I'll start uh, sharing my screen. Okay, yes. Yeah. Can see my screen? Yeah, all good. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, introduce myself. Uh, I'm uh, Mohammed Bouad. Uh, I'm architect and computational designer, and also for the moment, I'm PhD candidate at the University of New York in Portugal. Um, um, uh, my current research is about additive manufacturing with Earth and architecture. Uh, computational methodology for defining shell envelope system. So, um, just I'll try to explain uh, a bit about like the background of my education. First of all, I, I did uh, like a uh, couple of uh, research at IAC uh, in Barcelona. It's uh, like a master in advanced architecture. It's about like uh, developing uh, methodologies with additive manufacturing to print with sustainable materials and by using robotic fabrication processes. And um, so I'll start for the moment, uh, explain about my PhD thesis. Like basically it's uh, divided to three categories it's about the materiality, sustainable materials and machinery. And uh, the most concentration for the moment is about like design methodologies for 3D printing shell systems. So basically, um, we started to search and explore a lot about the materiality part, about different kinds of clay that is available in Spain and Portugal, and studying different uh, uh, types of fibers. Um, like uh, basically, we're trying to test earth-based composites. Uh, so first of all, we started to use like uh, uh, eco clay earth that is from Spain and also from Brazil city here in Portugal. They are very famous by producing pottery clay. So we have two types like earth and rain and uh, stoneware. And uh, we, we start also to add some kinds of binders like sodium silicate and hexatomate phosphate to increase the plasticity and the uh, viscosity of the material through the printing process. So basically we, we started this uh, this kind of material to make it more uh, printable in the printing process, uh, especially if you want to print cantilevers and or the shell uh, geometries. And uh, also we started to add different kinds of aggregates to increase the stiffness of the material, also the plasticity, also to decrease uh, the shrinkage and cracks uh, problems that we are facing after drying time and uh, also to make sure that the printing process is successful. So in terms of the materiality part, we're still in progress. We're still trying to explore more uh, for the moment. Uh, we're trying to test different kinds of materials to increase uh, the, the co cohesion of the particles of the earth itself. Um, then we start a test to, to know like uh, the water absorption of the earth-based composites. So basically, as you know, like when, when we try to uh, print cantilever will face something like mean by displacement or you have over small overhang uh, within each layer 
by using contour crafting methodology. Um, so basically, we tested different kinds of composites uh, to know how much this composite will absorb uh, water amount uh, to know after that, like uh, the cracking percentage uh, of each composite. So after testing uh, different types of fibers um, uh, with two types of, uh, you can say like uh, of clay, yeah, there's earthenware, stoneware. Um, we found out that uh, the more we add, for example, uh, a binder like a sodium silicate, it, it increased the plasticity of the material and also it's helped to reduce the, um, the amount of water that you add. And that will like, uh, help us to know that like, it's a methodology to reduce the cracking problems uh, within the material after the printing process. Um, so we we are trying to do like different uh, kinds of find outs to know like what is the formula that we need to use uh, with these kinds of materials in terms of fibers, in terms of binders, and also in terms of water and aggregates also. So as you can see here, this is the formula that we reached for the moment after doing different tests, uh, you know, with the normal uh, three axis 3D printing machine that is available uh, in the um, Advanced Ceramic Laboratory uh, that is based in Guimarães here in Portugal. Um, so after that, we found out that we need to develop part of the machinery that will help to uh, to print more complex composites. You know, like basically we were facing different uh, issues through extruding, you know, uh, like a base composite with fiber. Uh, so we tried to develop for the moment a, a part of the machinery or with three axis machine, but still we didn't test it yet, but it's still in the progress for the moment and probably uh, in the coming months we will try to use with the robot uh, to, to test uh, different uh, methodology, uh, printing methodologies. So before starting with design methodologies for 3D printing shell system, we, 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 we thought that we need to study different uh, the Asian uh, traditional methodology of 3D printing, you know, like by studying the historical timeline and reforms mystery structures, like trying to understand how uh, the old master they were building um, the shell geometries with Adobe block and how they were assembling uh, the blocks in such a way to make it more uh, stable and um, buildable. So we started uh, from the Asian Egypt uh methodologies until like nubian vault trying to understand the nubian vault methodologies how they were uh, organizing the blocks in such a way to be stable until for the moment the most advanced technology like by using additive manufacturing so you can say like we were trying to mimic the methodology between assembling process of the blocks and into a slicing process uh, or we can say the contour crafting methodology. So basically, we were also trying to make studies about understanding the surface topology uh, itself and how they were building the ribs that is support the, uh, the Adobe blocks uh, of the shell and, uh, and try to translate it to the 3D printing process. So basically, we found out that the, these two methodologies in the scale one to 10 are successful for the moment, like because we, can, we found out that when, once we add more, you can say uh, local inertia uh, of like uh, ribs, that is, um, you can say like we are segmenting the surface of the shell in such a way to increase the local inertia of the geometry, which which means that increase also, we found that the global inertia of the shell system, uh, which was really uh, uh, like helpful to prevent uh, the buckling, uh, uh, buckling issues th uh, of each layer uh, through the printing process. So we found, we took these methodologies, Asian uh, methodologies, and we translated and we found that it's successful in scale one to 10, but we need to test it later in scale one to five or bigger scale. Uh, but it's still like it's come in the, on the way. 
Um, so basically the main issues that we are trying to study, like basically uh, I did also in the research through my master degree that uh, trying to concentrate on the cantilever uh, in earth architecture. So we were facing basically the buckling uh, issue like um, within cantilevers. And so, so now we are trying to understand how we can prevent this problem, like this displacement through the printing process in order to print more complex geometries, you know, as a roof or shell system. Um, so we found out that if we try to do like a design a table uh, that, that you start from simple shell surface uh, and then trying to increase two parameters, like, you know, the ribs, which means the, the masses within the shell surface to increase uh, the local inertia and the global inertia, which means more stable, uh, will help to be more stable in the printing process until reaching, as you can see here, like we have different iteration. So uh, in this design table, we concentrated in two section lines, like uh, the extreme one and the uh, also the minimum one like in terms of the angles through the um, cantilevers. So for the moment we tested only the like the minimum one. So we found out after doing different simulation uh, by studying uh, like you know the overhang angles for a simple uh, shell geometry and it was like uh, for scale 1 to 10 uh, successful for the moment and then we tried to test more extreme things that we print half of the geometry and to see how much it can uh, sustain until the end of the printing process. And so after that, we found out once we add more, you can say like a, a masses within the shell surface, it was uh, basically more successful than like we don't, if we don't add anything, it was really hard to print like, you know, with three axis machine with a planner uh, printing process. So this is also another simulation for like, you know, like a geometry, it has like more a mass within the surface and it was basically has less uh, displacement. Uh, so as a final result, we found out that the more we add like a uh, small mathis, you can say, or rips as the, uh, as for example, at the Asian, uh, methodologies that they were adding like such a ribs within the geometry that will support the structure that will help uh, to reduce like the displacement or you can say uh, the buckling issue through the printing process. So then we start to find to test like uh, like different methodologies trying to testing this methodologies as like um, extracted from uh, like old methodology, like by stacking the geometries in such a way, um, like you see, like we have a, a specific geometry that is repeatable in, in some parts of the geometry. And we found out through the printing process, it was helping to support uh, each layer in such a way until building also, like you can say another geometry, like a dome, for example, uh like you know they were using for example in uh, uh in Hagia Sophia the church like they were adding appendages as such part uh, of building them so we took this element and we translated it to contour path uh, and uh, by testing like uh, different iterations uh, of, like one to ten uh, prototypes so after that, we studied also another methodology by adding uh, a ribs uh, that is support uh, the shell surface itself. As also, as you can see here, like normally, you know, it's like comparison, a comparison between like uh, the Adobe building process uh, and the contour crafting process and trying to find out uh, what is the best optimal uh, methodology that will help to print a complete, complete, complete geometry uh, without any uh, problems, you know, without any buckling issues, with a planar printing process for the moment. 
Um, so this is was the second methodology that we we used. Uh, you know, like a, a rep system, you can say, like we we named. After that, we, we now for the moment we're studying more advanced methodology. That is like uh, it is like uh, you are playing with the um, uh, orientation uh, of the plane through the extruding process. So basically, uh, this methodology is based on like you have such different layer heights in some places to make more condensed layers and another place as you can see here is different it has different layer height and also the orientation uh, through the printing process it, it take a role uh, to make the printing process more stable for the moment this uh, this methodology we don't we didn't test yet because still we're developing the extruder of the robot that we have that is available in the university but we are gonna uh, test this uh, methodology on more like a one to five scale. Uh, like you can say, it's like more like non planar 3D printing process. So, one of the, of the, uh, one of the projects that I was developing uh, in my master thesis, we were trying to develop uh, a modular system, like, uh, like for vertical walls, and we are we are trying to add like uh, a simple uh, cantilevers. So, but the main idea that is uh, inspiring me from this project that I did in my master program that it's help to integrate specific geometry with this kind of uh, technology uh, to integrate it with the specific community. For example, if you wanted to print an urgent shell, uh, urgent habitats in such a places. So that was like was an inspiration to to complete this research, but to be more um, like you said, you can say more uh, more complex geometries like as shell systems. So basically, now for the moment, uh, like we have like uh, this is like a simple design a methodology of a shell system. But the main idea it was about like a mixing between uh, you can say uh, the corbel methodology. Or we can say like uh, like a system. It can be integrated with another material, for example, like a wood, uh, to build also like uh, shading uh, elements in such places, and also to succeed with building like a complete uh, geometry to cover a complete surf a complete area. Um, like so. For the moment, like uh, we, this research is still in continuous way. Like you know, for the moment, I'm this in the second year, like of uh, my thesis. Uh, probably in the third year, we're gonna print like a, a real scale uh, shell system, like with sustainable materials. So you can see here, like for the moment, the research still in the humble uh, side, but. Uh, we can say we are concentrating more about the issues that most of the researchers they were facing uh, through the printing process. As I said, like for example, uh, the displacement and the uh, buckling issues, and also we are studying now the materiality part, like as a side, because after the drying time, we, uh, uh, according to my experience, like with the old projects in my master, we are facing like cracking. And shrinkage issued. So for that reason, like you've seen, like now the research we're concentrating on the critical parts. So we are adding fibers to uh, solve some issues uh, and reduce uh, the cracking and shrinkage part. And also, we want to achieve more uh, complex um, uh, geometries, you know, as a as a shell. Uh, by using advanced technology and sustainable materials, and trying also to implement it in modular system that could be integrated with the uh, like a specific community, and also to be integrated with other material. And um, for the moment, I like I don't have much to share with you, but like that's like the basic, you can say the basic approach that I, I reached for the moment. And I hope to reach more in the coming uh, months to share with you also. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, yeah, very um, 
um, very new research and also um, also showing the different uh, fabrication um, stage uh, from the other other few um, researchers and speakers. So um, thank you. Yeah, we can have some discussion. Uh, we still have um, some time for discussion about your your researches. Um, so uh, I saw a few. Professor Philip Yuan is also here. Um, do you want to say something about the, this topic? Because um, it's quite similar with, um, I think the, the yesterday's um, topic, um, very structured performance-based architecture design. Um, yeah, Professor Philip Yuan also have a research um, a paper and the direction about this uh, structured performance-based form finding. And so, I, Professor Philip Yuan, you want to say something uh, about this? Okay, um, thank you so much for the remarkable uh, lectures from uh, all of you. Thank you for your participation. And this is actually the PhD uh, consortium. We have 15 um, Tongji PhD candidates here uh, who participate uh, to these special courses, which is uh, like uh, two weeks, um, uh, uh, three courses. It's like a, a very intense and totally we have around 20 uh, professors make lectures and also we have this weekend we have two, uh, uh, two uh, Saturday and Sunday four sessions and um, we invited uh, young scholars coming here. So really spend the fantastic time, fantastic time with you. I think which will uh, uh, give uh, a special guidance to the PhD candidate student here help them to, uh, to, to uh, start their PhD study. Some of them are the year one um, student. I think uh, uh, it's interesting to this topic, uh, which is especially based on the structural performance design. And uh, 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 some of you uh, also make research on the uh, fabrication part. I think uh, this is extremely important topic, uh, performance, uh, material performance and the structural performance actually uh, influence a lot to uh, the, uh, uh, the computational design. So uh, the computation at the very beginning is starting from the geometrical research and for the formation process uh, at the very beginning of the digital uh, in architecture study, which is starting from the, the beginning of 90s. I think which lasting uh, around 30 years uh, for generation, uh, maybe two generation of researchers to, uh, to make research on that. And generally speaking, uh, from a parametric uh, geometrical study to the performance-based study is a big shift. I think uh, which is starting from uh, the beginning of this century, uh, actually uh, uh, a lot of uh, very famous professor professors like uh, Archimangus, uh, when uh, he teach uh, studio uh, in AA, he uh, actually uh, collaborating with Peter Truma, uh, 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 a lot of uh, young scholars at that time, they start to uh, begin uh, some research, they integrate, integrate their focus from uh, uh, the material performance to the structural performance. So actually this is a quite a cross-discipline or uh, intercept interdisciplinary research, we can find different approaches. For example, Cao Ting is uh, manipulate the graphostatics, which is really uh, 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 a tradition methodology actually from the Renaissance time, uh, 16th uh, century. Uh, uh, although it's a very tradition um, design methodology, but it's really useful to rethinking on the form diagram and force diagram. Uh, which is really fundamental, but actually after the digital methodology uh, uh, engage into the research process, we find uh, uh, it will be extremely uh, 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 interesting. Uh, a lot of people like Philip Block, like uh, Mansat, uh, um, his PhD right now, assistant professor in UPenn, uh, Mansat uh, Akbazat, uh, uh, he actually, uh, uh, introduce a polyframe, which is a three-dimensional um, uh, graphic statics uh, 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 generative uh, 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 plugin in Rhino, which is super uh, useful to help the uh, uh, architecture students uh, 
uh, to design different kind of uh, very complicated uh, form, which is starting from the uh, the, the 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 force diagram. Uh, I think uh, Cao Ting uh, uh, Cao Ting's research is uh, very interesting. Uh, 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 actually, my team uh, also very interesting that uh, from uh, 2014, 15, and we construct one building named Fab Union uh, on the west bank of Shanghai, which is also very similar based on the methodology with Cao Ting, uh, uh, based on graphic statics. And uh, uh, we also uh, uh, introduced uh, the Medipad uh, and the uh, Amoeba to also uh, uh, optimize uh, the structure. So normally for architects, interestingly, uh, we uh, deploy different uh, uh, plug-in developed by uh, structure engineer, but I think uh, which is fundamentally not only in the concrete structure shell, rule surface design, but also can deploy them in some tension structure, cable tension structure, form finding. And uh, what your uh, research probably for the mold system for the concrete uh, uh, UHPC concrete, which is also very interesting to, to us. So I think uh, one of the approach is the uh, graphic static study. Uh, and another uh, approach is, is uh, actually from uh, from next year. Uh, uh, we start to collaborate with each other and start uh, setting up this kind of workshop, workshop from 2012, 2013, which is really early. Uh, for architects to deploy uh, a BSO, which is uh, 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 infinity uh, element uh, optimization tools. Uh, and uh, we, we also test a different pos potential possibility in the chair design. And one of my studios chair was collected by Pompidou uh, uh, very early. Uh, I think it was based on the collaboration with BSO uh, algorithm. And I think uh, that is the another approach. Uh, the, the, the graphic statics and the BSO is quite different structure perform, performance-based tools. Uh, and, uh, 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 but the similar point for them is the very fundamental dynamic analysis um, uh, from the structure perspective. And uh, we try to figure out the, uh, the formation uh, which is generally based on this kind of uh, structure uh, principles. And I find uh, um, um, today, um, uh, Matthias' uh, study is really interesting, which is uh, like a very uh, efficient um, agent-based um, structure system. Uh, because I visited uh, your school um, years ago and uh, I have one, one day and rest uh, after the conference and I him driving me to the Manhattan uh, uh, multi hall and to visit that building and which is super impressive to me and, uh, and really like um, uh, iconic uh, project uh, which can teach us a lot uh, uh, based on uh, this kind of uh, uh, tension uh, and compression system by the timber structures but the 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 second part of your your lecture which is about the uh, the the agent based uh, systematic work for the multi story buildings and uh, for the joints and uh, which is super uh, computational based uh, but i think is that is different to some dynamic analysis from the graphic statics and uh, and 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 the bso which is more like a architecture structure system so i think uh, that is super different to compare to a purely uh, 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 a dynamic uh, structure-based analysis, uh, which is more like uh, uh, take some take the consideration from the earthquake, wind load, and details um, uh, 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 details design. Uh, so uh, I, we have a lot of collaboration or joint workshops with ICD over the past seven years. We're learning a lot from uh, from your uh, team. Actually, because you have ITKE and ICD, and that is a super uh, a smart collaboration between these two groups of uh, professors and students. I think uh, you're, you're actually learning a lot from each other. So that is really uh, remarkable. Uh, uh, so for the, for the future, I think uh, uh, architecture discipline and structural discipline collaboration is super important to, to set up that, this kind of uh, crossing team uh, uh, collaboration. So, uh, so I, I'm, I'm very interested in your uh, research. Uh, 
And um, Muhammad's research is about this, um, robotic fabrication, which is also uh, the topic of Digital Futures 2014, is robotic uh, fabrication based on the structural performance design. And we invited the pedagogy who is from Harvard GSD and the developer of uh, Medipad. He actually very early uh, uh, in that um, uh, conference put forward robotic fabrication collaboration with, with uh, structured performance-based uh, tools. We actually deploy and test uh, timber structure, uh, robotic timber structure, uh, robotic concrete printing, robotic glass printing, robotic clay printing in 2014, from 2014. I think uh, which is extremely uh, uh, interesting to integrate the, the structure design with the robotic fabrication. I think that's why we should use robotics because this kind of uh, formation will generate a form based on the rule surface, based on some uh, some differential um, uh, 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 unlinear uh, 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 geometry uh, 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 volumes and geometry system. So that's why the robotics can produce this kind of uh, 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 very uh, elegant uh, details uh, 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 in the printing process. So uh, I think it's uh, interesting. We already spent like um, seven, eight years and, uh, and focus on doing such kind of um, research. We should um, um, uh, uh, very focus on the material performance research, robotic uh, extruder effectors research, and nozzle research, and also about the robotic uh, 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 gantry system. If you want to print a microscale object, you need uh, institute or uh, offsite, and you need to design different kind of uh, 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 hardware system. So my team actually um, uh, is starting from this uh, research topic, uh, which is actually from the uh, digital future uh, workshops. And uh, we uh, uh, set up a system, including the Gantry robotic system, uh, Institute um, robotic system. We developed around nine generation of uh, Institute robotic system over the past few years. And also develop, develop uh, FU robot, which is a software to control all these kind of uh, 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 hardwares. And uh, we want to sharing all these uh, hardware platform to the world. So we publish it on the GitHub, which is totally open to anyone. If you're interested, you can download FU Robot, uh, which is a software to control all these kind of platforms. So I think uh, um, uh, that is a very cross-discipline research. And, and I'm very interested in the details, like Yanshin's research is really interesting, goes to the very um, uh, uh, detail research in different scenarios. And uh, Cao Ting, I think uh, you start teaching and um, uh, for your uh, profound uh, research and uh, 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 background, uh, I'm looking forward to see what's next you can produce to the academic, academic world because uh, it's a really uh, um, strong um, uh, knowledge system uh, from ETH. And uh, I'm looking forward to see uh, your uh, future academia. Uh, 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 career. So um, it's, it's no question, but I think it's like a comments uh, from all your guys. Uh, I think uh, it's very uh, influential and meaningful. Although uh, all of us probably were the pioneer in the discipline, <laughs> a big army uh, falling behind. Uh, it should be a very long time, maybe uh, 20 years, 30 years. Um, but I think this is the the, the, the only direction in the future because the intelligence of the tools will integrate uh, uh, will um, uh, integrate to the human intelligence. So uh, that's like um, extend, extension of human mind for the creativity, creativity and uh, uh, for the future um, uh, 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 knowledge system. So, um, I'm looking forward to see what's happening in this group of people. And uh, probably in the future, you're welcome to contribute your research to the Architecture Intelligent Journal, which is like a new community we set up because this kind of um, uh, scientific papers interest is important to all the researchers. We need uh, uh, learning from each other, sharing to each other, not only uh, 
from, uh, from this kind of lectures, but also we need to uh, write uh, scientific papers. And we should, based on generations of people's research and, and going to the, the future. So thanks um, a lot um, to your um, sharing and the contribution to the PhD consortium. And looking forward to see some of you are teaching uh, workshops uh, this time and in 2022 Digital Futures um, uh, event. So looking forward to have you, uh, 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 maybe some of you could be the critics to the final of the workshops. So uh, thanks for your contribution and the participation. Yeah, um, Nick, that's my uh, short <laughs> comments to, to all of you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Yuan, um, for the very good feedback and comments and suggestion to all the young scholars. Um, yeah, maybe my final comments is, um, is you can see most of the, the presenter today have a, a multidiscipline uh, background with architecture and, and structure. So I think it's, it's quite also important for the most of the university to integrate the disciplinary um, subject together. Uh, for the for the young students in the future. Um, okay, so any question or um, what was you want to speak um, from Xinyan, Cao Ting, Mahamud, and the Matthias? I'm sorry, I have a question. Can I say like for Professor Ting, right? I'm saying right. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, you can call me Ting. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, just I would like to ask you one question about the coplanarity surface and how did you design the surface topology? Uh, I mean, like I have seen like in your pre uh, interesting presentation that you are segmenting the surface topology in such a way that to distribute the load, uh, that's what I understand, like you are trying to use the graphical static methodology and to um, you are segmenting the surface topology uh, in such a way to be more uh, like uh, stable, right? Like, uh, because I have seen this is interesting to me if I want to develop such a methodology for the surf surface of the shell and by using this methodology in order to know, like, for example, the area of each surface um, within the, you know, within the shell surface itself. So my question is like, how you are segmenting or you're designing this topology, there's specific software or like. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, um, yeah, as I mentioned in my presentation, like uh, the basic rules to join the adjacent hypers together is the coplanarity principle. And then mm -hmm. myself de develop a, a small uh, grasshopper tool so that uh, they can join the hypers to follow in this principle. I mean, I didn't show in this presentation because of the time limitation. Uh, there is a basic somehow a methodology to join these hypers together to some some room for double curved uh, surface at the end. But the basic um, basic constraint is this is this coplanarity principle. Um, yeah, to ensure I mean to that the coplanarity principle is to ensure that. Uh, the internal force of the of the shell can be transmitted always in the plane, can be mm -hmm. always membrane force without spending more moment uh, if they are under the self weight. Because in the previous work of Candela, when they combine the hypers together, they always, I mean, they always had this folded edge. This is where the internal force accumulated and where the supports are necessary. So that's why they need the steep and being there. I mean, with the, with the coplanarity principle, we can do that. Uh, yes, actually I was also, because when, when we made this one of the uh, hyper wave, this one, the, the timber grid shell in Shanghai, I was discussing with my collaborators whether we can, we can fabricate it with uh, um, clay with clay or adobe, with clay, that's what you, the material you are using, right? The, the material mm -hmm. used for uh, pre 3D printing, because you, you know that uh, uh, Pierre-Louis Larry, he developed a um, fabrication method called uh, ferrocement, that they use the uh, uh, steel mesh, the rebar mesh as a formwork, as a lost formwork, 
and then cast the concrete above it. So we were thinking that we can do something similar. We can do the uh, for the for the network. I mean the like uh, uh, with bamboo strips, like we do the reinforcement network with bamboo uh, strips, and then we uh, cast the claim above it. So that the, I mean, we were thinking that could be a, a, a good strategy to fabricate the claim mesh. And I think that could be related to your research. Uh, for me, I found that interesting because like I, I found you, you are trying to, as you said, distributing the forces in such a way to be more stable. And mm -hmm. also I felt somehow I, I, like I can integrate something like this mm -hmm. with the design methodology. But basically, as, you, as I said, like in my case, I'm not using basically the casting process. Mostly I'm relying on the contour crafting methodology. Mm -hmm. So, but, but the design surface methodology are really important in terms of controlling the angle of the surface mm -hmm. so, yes. and, and distributing the things. So for that reason, I found out it's interesting to understand from you, how did you develop this thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but in your works, I mean, I saw your works, I was trying to understand the structural behavior. You didn't put any reinforcement inside it, right? Uh, so, just so I'm, that... I'm relying on the material part, you know, I'm adding fiber. But still, uh -huh. still for the moment, I didn't uh, try the composite because I have issue with the extruder system. Like, you know, for the moment, I'm, I'm testing only with the clay with the some uh, sands, like aggregates, but I didn't extrude a complete layer with the fiber. That's what I'm mm -hmm. facing because uh, the main issues that I'm trying to reach that the fiber could be uh, like uh, help for the structure performance of the geometry, the material mm -hmm. part. Like that's the main issue that I'm so, facing. Yeah. Mohammed, I think uh, as a paveling or the installation is fine, but if it goes to the full scale, one to one scale, real building and um, the fiber, uh, clay printing or fiber concrete printing uh, is should be um, proved uh, by the experiments um, we my team also doing a similar work i think it is also the question to Cao Ting. Uh, i think uh, the 3d graphics um, formation can only generate uh, uh, the reasonable reasonable compression only form but sometimes uh, in the architecture design we need some form, maybe not, uh, it's, it's very difficult to follow the, the optimal uh, formation. Sometimes the architects need some form, which is not the uh, optimal. Uh, we need to make a certain kind of optimization. For example, uh, my, my office right now design a, a vault, which is super flat. Maybe it's sometime you need to, to be a special angle. Uh, that is the best for compression only. But if you, it goes to very flat and you need uh, to, to check all the shear forces or the uh, uh, tension forces, uh, and, uh, uh, from this perspective, sometimes the, the, the double curvature surface is really difficult to, uh, to follow by this kind of optimal uh, formation from the gravistatics. We need to uh, take in account uh, the more complicated systematic thinking that's why I think the ICD research is interesting because they, uh, they actually, uh, they, that is more like a, a structured design. It's not just a, a graphical uh, or dynamics um, design in the forces. I think uh, architecture is more complicated when you take in account, consider the earthquake, consider the, uh, the, 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 the wind forces or the, the snow loads. Uh, and uh, or the dead loads, uh, point loads, I think that is even more complicated compared to the super pure um, formation from the graphistatics. I think, um, uh, but the graphistatics is, is really smart. Um, uh, uh, a lot of uh, PhD students actually can develop different plugin based on these fundamental rules, um, a form diagram, force diagram which is really uh, uh, interesting. But I think um, uh, when you go further to the architecture, uh, that's a, that is a fundamental principle can help you to generate certain kind of form. Like uh, you, in your lecture, we, we also learn from Chris, um, maybe another professor from ETH. I think his uh, study is interesting. 
but consider the earthquake condition in China, and uh, we need to uh, introduce uh, some more knowledge uh, compared to the, the graphic statics research only, that is maybe not enough uh, for, mm -hmm. especially for earthquake um, research, uh, forces research. Yeah, I think uh, Professor Yuan, yes, it's right. The uh, graphic statics is very popular it's because it's quite, uh, quite useful for the design conceptual stage. At that stage, it's very uh, easy to manual and easy to somehow integrate it with architectural forms. And for the final calculation, sometimes we also involve the FEM software like Gramba to make the test of the, uh, the calculation to design the section of the structure. And you mentioned about the limitation for the graphic statics to design tension structure or some structure with bending moment or shear force. I mean, it depends on how you see the form diagram of graphic statics. That's also the, somehow the main uh, different issue between our chair and uh, the chair of Block, uh, Professor Block. Because in our chair, uh, the form diagram is, you can understand, I mean, it's some kind of strat and tie model. That means it's a more structural model with only tension and compression. If you think the structure time model equals to equal to the final shape of structure, then we can only design truss or shell, spatial truss or shell. But sometimes if you if you want to design a surface structure and you are able to allow some bending moments, um, yet to increase the uh, increase uh, somehow the uh, the uh, material cyclic uh, material cyclic, or to uh, fold it at some part to make it more stiff. And then you can still use graphic statics. They're just like the parts where you have the bending moment, you design as a truss, spatial truss. Um, yeah, yeah, because we also use, um, that's also the, the, the conflict between Professor Schwartz and the Professor Block in terms of teaching, because Professor okay. Schwartz insisted to introduce, Professor Block insisted to introduce bending, the conception of bending moment to students. But for Professor Schwartz, he thinks all the shear force and bending moment can be represented by uh, compression and tension, that means strut and time. So, I mean, if you consider the, the, the form diagram, is a, some kind of hint for the final volume of the structural material, then you can use graphic aesthetics to do design all, all kinds of structures. That's not a problem. I think the main problem is like at the end of the design, it may need some more efficient, uh, efficient uh, tools to do the calculation, to somehow to retest the calculation. But in terms of design itself, it uh, doesn't have too much limitation. I think I, because like the research of Professor Philip Block or the research of myself, we, because we are a research, so we only focus on a very special type of structures and try to reach the very extreme situation. But actually uh, this method could be generally applied to all the type of structures. Uh, without limitation. The only limitation is that the part of material, yeah, because it somehow made some uh, limitation, it somehow ignored the, um, the elastic process of the elastic deformation process of the material. So that's why it's uh, independent from the material. The, the, the calculation process is in independent from the material. So somehow it has a, a difference between the, the real world and then you need another Sometimes you need another um, yeah, some, uh, tool to test this. But for Professor Schwartz himself, he insisted he can design everything with, uh, with the blue and the red lines. But uh, you know, some people work in his office also use the <coughs> FEM tool to do the optimization and calculation. I mean, it's just a difference of the tool. Um, every tool has a limitation, so. Right. Okay. Good. Thank you so much. I understand. Thank We're you. looking forward to have some further discussion in the future, because we, my office, doing the real um, project. Um, so sometimes, at the very beginning, we generate this kind of form based on the tools. But um, when you go to the details or the 
uh, examining process, uh, and that is extremely difficult to prove such kind of form is reasonable by the regulations and by the proving, by the proving process. And um, yeah, looking forward to have more uh, discussion with you, Cao Ting, in the future. Yeah. Okay, I also need to need to. I mean, I'm not an expert in that because I don't have real too much. In, I mean, experience on that uh, pro, real project, but it's also a nice chance to go through this um, process to see how we can, from the beginning to the end, how can we achieve it. Mm. That would be great. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Thank you for all the uh, speakers and uh, uh, Professor Philip Yuan and provide this uh, platform for, for the young scholars. So hopefully we can see each other um, in person next time. So maybe next chance is the, um, the ISS Melbourne next year, hosted by Mike Shear and uh, Jim Barry. Um, mm -hmm. So welcome everyone um, come to Melbourne to have the ISS 2023. I think it's very interesting. Um, um, the conference for the, all the all the um, the researchers has a both um, architecture and structural backgrounds. So, what's the schedule for ISS next year? It's uh, uh, November. It's mid of July. Mid of July. Oh, mid of July. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you, everyone. So, um, we finished the this symposium. Um, also, this is the last one. And uh, uh, you can enjoy the, the, the next events for the Digital Future um, uh, Conference this year. Thank you. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Nice weekend.